greetings. Well, good morning. Welcome. Good to see you as we gather for worship this morning on the Lord's Day. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. We like to take a few times throughout the year and recognize our veterans, those who have served. Of course, Memorial Day remembers those who have perished in serving our country. We want to take a moment to honor those who are living. So if you are a veteran or you served in the military in any way, will you stand for a moment so we can recognize you? Thank you. You can be seated. Grateful for what you gave. If you're watching online and in that group, thank you as well. I have a special moment of prayer for you and our country uh, later in the service. Let me also make you aware of the other announcements for today. Plan to come tonight and stay afterwards for a reception in honor of Dave and Brody Bush. They're moving to Wisconsin, have family up that way. We'll miss them. They've been a great part of our congregation for almost six years now, so they'll be missed. It's their last Sunday today, so come tonight, after the evening service tonight. We'll have a time of fellowship with them. We'll provide all the food. Just come, and we'll enjoy that time. And then there is the baby shower for Jennifer Brooks, Saturday, June 19th, here at the church, 10 to 1130. You can find Jennifer's registry on Amazon. And then lastly, as a session and as the deacons, we want to thank you from the deacons uh, for supporting the work of the church. We, we do report uh, the monthly offering each month that goes towards running the ministry here, preaching the gospel, supporting missionaries, but also, as you very well know, uh, renovating the sanctuary. So we've had some gifts come into that fund. We're thankful for that. Of course, all of the overage in our budget, whenever we get more than we need, uh, we also use that to put towards the sanctuary renovation. So as you faithfully give, whether you designate it that way or not, it is getting to the project, and we're grateful. So uh, we give our thanks to God primarily. We're thankful for the evidence uh, of his provision there, so keep it up. All right, those are all the announcements I have for today. So let's give our attention to the front of the bulletin. God calls us to worship through his word. Let's read Romans 8 responsibly. I'll read the regular print. You answer in the italics. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now that we are children, Come, let us worship this Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do come into your presence. We assemble together as the church, as your temple that you've built. And this is where your spirit dwells. And we thank you for that. And we call on you. We call on the name of the Lord and ask that you would be with us this morning. Thank you for the life of the spirit that sets us free from sin that enables us to live holy lives, that the Spirit has adopted us so that we are the children of God and we call upon you as our Father. We thank you that you love us and we thank you that you are gracious. By grace, we are saved. So that's the name we call on this morning, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all glorious, worked in together for the salvation of your people and deserving of all praise of all thanksgiving and all worship. We call on your name this morning asking that you would receive our praise, that you would give us grace, that you would be glorified today and in the next hour as we worship you. And we pray to you as in the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's worship the Lord by singing Him 100. Holy, holy, holy. Stand with me and sing Him 100. our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, suffered under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
pray for us, please. Let's pray. Our dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to gather in your home, this, in your house this morning, and worship you as we gather together and um, give honor and remember those who have sacrificed so much for us to be here this morning. We pray for all those families and those in the past. Lord, as we gather here in our church family, we pray that you be with us, guide us, watch over us, keep us safe. Uh, remember all those who are not able to be in, in church today. We pray that your message would flow to them. Now, as we go today, we pray that everything we do would bring honor and glory to your name. All these things we ask, pray in Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's give our thanks to God using the words of hymn 302. Come Christians, join to sing hymn 302. I do believe in the virgin birth, though I tried to omit it from saying the <laughs> Apostles' Creed this morning. Let's use this short recitation here to call us to confession, and we'll pray silently for a moment, and then I'll leave this. Let's read this together. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Let's pray silently for a moment. Gracious Lord God, you love us and you've chosen us to be a royal priesthood to give to you spiritual sacrifices. So we come to you in this time of prayer and intercession. Father in heaven, gracious God, you've called us out of darkness. You've called us into your marvelous light. And we bless you because you're the rock of our salvation. You're solid and sure and steadfast. And so we pray that you would forgive us of sins this morning. Where we've sinned against you or one another, forgive us. Where we've done what we shouldn't have or failed to do what we should, Lord, forgive us. And we pray for the church, pray for this church here, the Roebuck Congregation, founded on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. So grant, Lord, that our church would be firmly established in Christ. 
built up in him, doing his work, filled with his love. You've called us to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so we pray for the leaders of our church here. We pray for our elders, we pray for our deacons, we pray for the ministries that go on here with youth and families and the congregation for the sanctuary renovation. And we pray for our sister churches like Mount Calvary and Powell and the folks that are ministering there, all the churches here in Spartanburg County and beyond. Lord, again, you called us to be your holy people, your own people, called out from the nations and from the other peoples. And yet we find ourselves here in this nation, so we pray for it. We pray for its welfare, for your blessing to be upon it. Pray for those who mourn this week, whose family members or others have lost their lives, that you would comfort them, that you would give them grace. We do pray for the United States of America, and we thank you for the abundance of blessings you've given us in our heritage. You have lavished on us good things, land and access to resources. We even think of good traditions that have been handed down in our country to, to value hard work, uh, the pursuit of justice, to be honest in our dealings with one another. So we pray for ourselves as a nation, as a people group, that we might rediscover the beauty of holiness. Those traditions are not necessarily being passed on or not valued as they once were. Work through your church to see revival and an increase of people knowing the Lord and serving the Lord in our country and loving holiness. We do pray for the institutions you've given us, legislatures and courts, businesses, industries, other jobs, universities and schools, even theaters and places of entertainment that, again, we might value uh, the bright light of purity, the radiance of holiness, the true light of freedom. We mourn when we see sin valued and celebrated. And we pray that in your grace you might restrain that, again, make your church strong, that we might see more people saved. We thank you for our veterans. Thank you for the many we have in this congregation or in our families. And thank you for the years they spent serving to advance those freedoms and that cause. And I pray you would bless them and continue to give us men and women who will work in that way in a hardworking, just way. We do pray for the needs of our congregation today. We think of Libby's nephew, Bart Casey, in this accident. I do pray. Uh, thank you for some good news that he's improving. It also looks like a long slow recovery. So I pray that he would know your grace during this time. You, you would be pleased to relieve his pain and give him patience, that he might know the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would lean on you during this time as the good shepherd. And for us as a congregation, again, that you would be at work here, pursue the work of the kingdom that we've talked so much about in recent weeks in the Psalms. Use us to advance your kingdom. Give us holiness of heart and mature and be at work in this congregation. And we will give you all glory, all praise, gracious Lord, our great high priest. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And hear God's word of pardon. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Let's turn this morning to Psalm 108. Psalm 108, in the Old Testament scriptures, I'll read the full psalm, verses 1 to 13, and then we'll use the response printed there in your bullet. Psalm 108. Beginning at verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, heart and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Save us and help us with your right hand, that those you love may be delivered. 
God has spoken from his sanctuary. In triumph, I will parcel out Shechem and measure off the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. On Edom, I toss my sandal. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, God, you who have rejected us and no longer go out with our armies? Give us aid against the enemy, for human help is worthless. With God, we will gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray again one more time. Lord, now enlighten our eyes and help us to understand your word. Grant that we will respond with faith in obedience. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We come today to book five of the Psalter, the last division in the book of Psalms. And here's the story so far. Book one emphasizes the theme of confrontation. God anoints David to serve as the king of his people. And yet David struggles with numerous enemies who are opposed to God's reign. God therefore assures him, I will be faithful to my covenant promises and establishes David eventually as king. In book two, similar themes continue. David still has some struggles with his enemies, but now there's a new emphasis on communication with the surrounding nations. Israel is speaking to other nations and inviting them, join in the praise of God. You bring your offerings to the temple in Jerusalem as well. God will reign and he will be king over the world. But when we come to book three, we find the sin of God's people. Their lack of trust in God has brought the devastation of exile. The nations haven't been subdued. Instead, they have subdued Israel, reduced Jerusalem and its temple and city to the ground and thrown the crown of the Messiah into the dust. <coughs> and yet there's hope. For book four presents a matured perspective on the promises of the Davidic covenant. Now these Psalms emphasize God himself dwells among you. As your king. He is the ultimate king of his people. And yes, he will realize his promises to David's line. Eventually, a king from the line of David, he will rule, and there will be this perfect union of David's rule and God's rule. And so now, in book five, the Psalter is ready to present that climactic movement, the consummation of the kingdom. And the praises that come to God from his subjects. And with that theme in mind, with the theme of consummation on our minds, who should reappear in Psalm 108 but David? Psalm 108 is a psalm of David. And the Davidic psalms have been thin since books 1 and 2. Here in book 5, though, they appear with a similar frequency... So what we saw in books one and two. Why? Because it's time to move towards the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom. We've gone through the exile. We've gone through the suffering. Now God is sending his king and things are on track towards the triumph. Let me say one more thing about Psalm 108, how it shows us that theme. Then we'll jump right into the psalm itself. Psalm 108 cites two previous Davidic Psalms, Psalms 57 and 60. In other words, most of Psalm 108 is in Psalms 57 and 60. But Psalm 108 omits material from both Psalms. It omits from Psalm 57 the verses where David is being chased by his enemies. And it omits from Psalm 60 where Israel is is being chastised. Why? Why leave out those two themes? Because at this point in the story, at this point in redemptive history, the psalmist is painting a brighter picture for the nation. God's people, his kingdom, is moving towards an era 
of peace and prosperity. It's kind of like the difference between Kings and Chronicles. Kings was written to the generation going into exile. And the author was trying to prove, you brought this on for your sin. Chronicles is written after they come back. And some of the negative material is omitted in order to say God has forgiven you and he is moving forward with hope and with his promises. That's where the Psalms are now moving. Towards the triumph of God's kingdom. And as Christians, friends, we actually live in the era in which God's kingdom has already begun. It's not yet been consummated. That's why we pray the way we do this morning, for God to advance his kingdom, to restrain sin. King Jesus hasn't visibly appeared to rule over the world, but yet he is reigning. He has begun to reign. He has taken his throne. And we are the people who live waiting for him to appear. So, how are we to live in that kingdom? What is life like in God's kingdom? Among us as the people of God, what should life be like? Well, Psalm 108 answers that question this morning. So let's look at Psalm 108 and consider what is life like in God's kingdom? And the answer gives, the, the psalm gives us three answers. First, life in God's kingdom calls forth your praise. There are some key words and phrases in verses 1 through 5, and they deserve our focus. Verse 1 reads, My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. So the word heart, again, that's the seat of who you are. It's the steering wheel, almost, with what you feel, what you will, where your life is moving, your direction, your will. And David here says, my orientation, my direction in life is steadfast in God. So perhaps the idea is that David is confident in God. And because of that, he will therefore sing and make music with God. And we, of course, reflect his glory back on him. If you've been rescued from the dominion of Satan and brought into the kingdom of Jesus, you will be characterized by praise. That's what life is like in God's kingdom. In verse 2, David calls on the harp and the lyre, two instruments, to wake up and awaken the dawn. Why the dawn? Well, dawn is the time when deliverance and vindication happens. So that's how the Psalms sometimes talk. You go through the night of mourning, the night of suffering. The sun coming up is viewed as that's God arising to vindicate his people. And so much of these Psalms, they've been looking forward to that future day. They've been calling on God to appear and fulfill his promises. And so if we're in that kingdom then we are the people who we do. We anticipate that day. And at the same time, we praise God for how he's already begun to bring it out. We're people of hope. We're people of confidence. Verse 4 reads, Great is your love, higher than the heavens. And again, the word love here, not, not merely an attitude, not merely uh, an emotion, so to speak. It's an emotion that leads to an activity, and that activity will benefit the recipient. So when we read that God's love is great, it means that God's direction towards us, God's movement towards us, is one that will benefit us. His love arises from, let me read this quote, the context of a deep and enduring commitment between two persons or parties, by one who is able to render assistance to the needy party, who is in the circumstance unable to help him or herself. This is one of those Old Testament words that reoccurs over and over again to indicate God's loyalty to his people, God's faithfulness to his people, his obligation, his commitment, his devotion. That is how God relates to his people. And it's interesting that the psalm would zero in on that attribute. All of God's attributes praise him, including his justice, which will one day be dis uh, dispensed when he comes again. But after all that sin and after all that punishment, which 
attribute of God rises to the top. His love and his faithfulness. That's the stance God has taken towards his people. And so this first section concludes in verse 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. When God acts to advance his kingdom, his kingdom people praise him for his attributes. That's why we sing. You know, we sing in order to give praise to God, to make the songs of our lips give glory to our Savior. Also, when you think about praising God, that, that will help give shape to your personal prayer time. So do you ever get down and, and you want to pray to start your day or, or end your day? All right, what do I say? What do I do uh, during this time? Spend time thanking God for his faithfulness. Spend time praising God for who he is. Yes, there's a time to ask and, and that comes too. But if you wonder, okay, does that count? I mean, is that prayer time? Sure. Just take the word of God. Take what you know of God and thank him for it. Praise him for it. And if you spend time doing that, you will be better for it. And God will be glorified from you, his child. So a large part of our prayer, a large part of our worship, a large part of our life in God's kingdom is about praising him. And secondly, then, life in God's kingdom involves you in God's mission. I'm thinking of the middle verses here, verses 6 through 9, they describe God's victory over the nations, and particularly the nations that surround Israel. So look at some of these names. In verse 7, God says, In triumph I will parcel out Shechem and measure off the valley of Succoth. Now Shechem, that's the territory west of the Jordan River, so the main area of Israel. The valley of Succoth represents the region east of the Jordan. So they're just locations on the west and east side, but they seem to be representing then the whole, all of the west, all of the east, all of the territory of the people of God. Verse 8 then becomes more specific. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter. So again, Gilead is located east of of the Jordan River. And you may remember that uh, you had half of the tribe of Manasseh living over there east of the Jordan River. So both Gilead and Manasseh, once again, eastern locations of the Jordan River. Ephraim takes us back on the west side. That's one of the two largest tribes on the west side of the Jordan River. Ephraim was one of Joseph's sons. Judah, like Ephraim, again, a major tribe west of the Jordan River. And, of course, that's where David came. Hence the reference here to the royal scepter. So, again, the whole point is God has his people. He rules them. He owns them. And through them, he will wage war and exercise authority. That's why you have the reference in verse 7. God has spoken from his sanctuary in triumph, I will parcel out this land. From among God's people, that's where he, that's where he exercises his authority. But notice lastly, verse 9. Moab is my wash basin. On Edom I toss my sandal. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. Now we are getting outside of the borders of national Israel. We're getting outside of the geography of Israel and the people groups that are mentioned here, they don't directly descend in the line of covenant secession, so to speak. Some of them are loosely related to the people of God, but they're outside the territory. They're outside of the covenant family. But how does God speak of them? He still says they are under his authority and... They belong to his people. Now, how does that work? Moab, if Moab is God's wash basin, that might sound really negative, like he praised Israel and then let's dump on these nations. But the wash basin just communicates the idea of having the status of a servant, 
a nation that serves God. When God throws his sandal over Edom, again, that's possessing. We see that in Ruth, where the sandal is exchanged as a sign of possession. And if God shouts in triumph over Philistia, well, that's how he started the list. So he's saying, I've conquered my people and I've conquered Philistia. All these surrounding nations are under my authority and they're joining my people. Now we might ask, okay, well, what does that reign of God look like? Do you mean when Jesus shows up, he will take possession of those nations? Well, again, he's already begun taking possession of those nations. Listen to another reference from the prophets. Listen to Amos 9. God makes this prophecy about Israel and Edom. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. So the prophet says, all right, in the last days, God is going to come back to his people. He's going to restore David's kingdom and David's kingdom will conquer the nations. And that includes Edom. Now, how does that prophecy come to pass? Stick with me here. Let me read you from another passage. Acts 15. Listen to the words of the Apostle James. He says, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. And then he reads... Amos 9. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, hear the explanation. In Acts 15, there's a controversy in the church. And the controversy is, do Gentiles, be, do they need to first become Jews in order to be Christians? In other words, do Gentiles have to receive circumcision and then they can believe in Jesus Christ? They have to do both of those. In order to be saved. Well, James argues, and the assembly will agree with him. In the Old Testament, it says that one day the nations are going to join God's people. And they will do it as Gentiles. In other words, God's going to reign over Edom. And it doesn't say that Edom will become Jews. It just says God's going to reign over Edom. He's going to possess all these foreign nations. Therefore, Gentiles don't need to first become Jews. In order to become Christians, they're saved by faith alone. Now you say, okay, what does this have to do with Psalm 108? When the Bible uses this language, when it talks about Jesus reigning over the nations, it is talking about Jesus taking possession of the nations as they become Christians. First and foremost, there's a day of judgment coming. But it begins right now as Jesus takes authority over the nations by saving people from all the nations. That's how Psalm, that's how the whole Psalter began. Remember Psalm 2? The Father promises the Son, ask me, I will make the nations your inheritance. And so then the Father exhorts the kings of the earth, kiss the Son, make peace with the Son, submit to his reign. And that's why 1 Corinthians 15 says the Son is already reigning and will do so until he puts all enemies under his feet. So, here's the question for us. What is the mission of this church to participate in Jesus' reign? How do we participate in Jesus' reign? We call the nations to obey him in faith. That is how we should invest our time and our energy and our resources as a church. We gather first to worship, and then we go out to take the good news to others. And that means then that church life is all about worship, and it is all about kingdom. And kingdom particularly here in this area of outreach and missions. Again, that's why verse 7 says, God speaks from his sanctuary, from the temple, 
God's reign goes out and calls the nations to himself. So maybe there are times when you think, I just wish my church would speak a little bit more to social issues. Or I wish my church would give more political commentary. That is not why we exist. We exist to worship God. We exist to take the gospel to the nations. If we don't do that, no one else will. And mature believers get excited about taking part in those works. Now, the Bible also speaks of Jesus' reign in terms of judgment. So John 3.18 reads, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So unbelievers are already presently under the judgment of God. And they will experience that judgment in full when Jesus comes again. Just like if you're a believer, you're already saved. And you will receive full salvation when Jesus comes again. So the point is, there is still time now to cross from being an enemy of Jesus to joining his people. Because when he comes, he is going to dispense perfect judgment. So all the emphasis here is on Jesus saving the nations. But the Bible also speaks loudly about judgment already and in the day to come if you do not reconcile with God. Today he offers salvation and you will find if you submit to him, he is a good ruler. He is worth serving. He is worth praising. Maybe you read language like verses 7 through 9 where God's ruling the nations and, and taking possession of Moab. And you say, you know, that just sounds really xenophobic. Why, why is the Bible always talking about God, you know, and his people conquering the nations? What is it with Christians and authority? Well, again, how do we conquer the nations? With God's truth. How do we conquer the nations? Or what does it mean to conquer the nations? What would conquering a nation look like? In terms of the word of God, it would see people brought to obey Jesus, becoming Christians, submitting to him as king. Not us, not our agenda, not anything else, just submitting to Jesus as king. That is what we take out to other people. And again, if this sounds too power hungry, ask this question. How did Jesus get authority over the nations? Because he was first conquered by the nations put to death in order to pay for their sins and reconcile us to God. Now resurrected and vindicated, he claims those nations for himself. And life in God's kingdom involves you in that mission. Lastly then, thirdly, life in God's kingdom pushes you to trust what you can't see. It pushes you to trust what you can't see. The end of the psalm begins with a question, verse 10. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? In other words, who's going to bring about this promised victory? Well, we know the implied answer, God. And David makes this explicit in verse 11. Is it not you, God? You who have rejected us and no longer go out with our armies? Now, that may sound like, oh, we're going back to this earlier perspective where God has rejected his people, or this is a faithless expression from David here. No, the next two verses give us the answer to the question. Give us aid against the enemy, for human help is worthless. With God, we will gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. Verse 10 is essentially asking, any volunteers? Anyone want to step up and give us this victory? And the implication from verses 12 and 13 is God will. There's a recognition that maybe it doesn't appear to be that way now, but there is confidence that God will arise and bless his people. So this is just how David in this psalm expresses his confidence that God will appear and bless his people. Sometimes children ask, why can't we see God? Well, according to the psalm, apparently adults ask that question at times as well. You see, if we reason from appearances, it can seem God is not with his people. 
But the promise of the psalm is that God is present even when we don't see him. And so we cry out to God for help. We trust him that he'll deliver us. We reason not from the standpoint of appearances and experience, but from the perspective of God's mercy, God's promises. And therefore we trust he will eventually gain the victory. We walk with him in humble dependence. We don't just claim, all right, I'm in the church, I'm part of the kingdom, I'm, I'm with that. We show that by what we trust. And life as a Christian will push you to trust what you can't see. When Jesus came to Jericho in Mark 10, there was a blind man sitting by the road, Bartimaeus by name. And when he heard that Jesus was coming, somehow he knew who Jesus was. He knew what Jesus could do, even though he couldn't see him. And so as Jesus passed by, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many people rebuked him. They said, be quiet. Well, that only made him shout louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus eventually stopped, healed him, and told him, go, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight. That blind man couldn't see Jesus, but he knew what Jesus had promised. And so he trusted that. And because he trusted that, he received his sight. So where is God pushing you to trust him? Even if you can't see the way forward, you don't know how something is going to work out. Where is God pushing you to trust him? Where is he pushing you to change? Maybe it's an area of your life you don't want to change. Where is God pushing you to change? He's a good king. You can trust him to take care of you if you submit to him. Because that's what life is like in God's kingdom. Let's pray. Let's give thanks. Lord God, again, we do thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, his love, his covenant faithfulness, his victorious death and resurrection. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us when we don't praise you, trust you, participate in your mission, get off mission. Give us a clear sight of how good and glorious you are. Excite our praises. Help us to participate in your mission. Show us what gifts or abilities or resources we have to put towards that mission. And bless it, Lord. Bless it here in Rova, in Spartanburg County, in Pauline, or other surrounding areas, out to the state through the nation, the very ends of the world. Would you please bless the work of your kingdom? Use us. Don't pass us by. Use us as well. And thank you for how much uh, you have done and are doing for us. And help us to be a people of praise, trust, who wait on you, love you and serve you until you come again. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing lastly today, hymn 92, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Based on Psalm 46, Luther's Hymn of trust and confidence. Let's stand together, sing him 92.
hear God, receive God's blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you.